so pleased to have at the table Anthony Riccio. Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. You write all about Italians. You write all about immigrants. You're into your sixth book now. It's called From Italy to the North End. Um, we should say you are Italian. Your family came from where my, in Italy? My, they came from a, a, a region in, in Italy that's called the Campania, which is where the majority of people in New Haven came from. The Campania is Naples and inland. We were, most of us were pretty much farming folk. I mean, they were fishermen, like the people that came from Amalfi that li lived on Worcester Street were most of the fishermen. But there were lots of people that came from the backlands, you know, the rural parts of the, of the countryside, and that was the Campania. And that's, uh, those were my roots. You know, we were just pretty much peasant farming folks. When did you start writing, and why was it important to you to capture the past? Well, I, my light bulb really didn't go on until I was in my mid-40s. Which what was I, yesterday, Yes, right? which was yesterday. Yeah. I really didn't, uh, it didn't really strike me that, um, you know, if I didn't do something about it, it was going to be all lost. And I had had all these experiences. I had studied in Italy. Um, I had spent summers finding my roots, finding my family. I had traveled extensively through Sicily and uh, mostly through southern Italy photographing. And then I had the wonderful experience of, of experiencing an Italian-American neighborhood that was still intact. And that was the north end of Boston in the late 70s. So I had accumulated all these, uh, these wonderful experiences. It wasn't just experiences, it was the people that I had met, all these Italian-Americans, these immigrants who had come from the lands that I had visited. I had gone back and found my family. I had gone back and, and had lots of, lots of experiences, and I had spent a year in Florence studying. Oh, I hate when that happens. Yeah, it's that a was a beautiful place. It was a, 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 you know, I was just a kid from the, from the east side of New Haven, and here I am studying you know, Renaissance art history with some of the greatest in the world. I had that experience. So I had all these different experiences, not just growing up Italian-American, which is another story, but even having experienced Italy. So by the time I hit my mid, well, mid early 40s, I realized that, I looked around and I thought, who's doing anything about saving our roots? You know, I seen the Godfather. Um, I thought, you know, I'm gonna give them their artistic license. It, artistically, it was, it was a good movie, but I didn't really feel, I didn't really think that it would, really captured mm -hmm. who we really, really are. And I thought, okay, and I kept waiting to see if someone was going to do something where they would document, where they would capture the essence of who we were, what, did, you know, what we inherited, who nurtured us. Who was the Italian immigrant that came to this country? Just describe who that was. Well, the Italian immigrant was someone who was hungry. He was hungry for, and she was too, let's not forget the women. Uh, they were hungry for a better life and they were willing to go out and get it. They were willing to sweat and, 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 and work really, really hard. Uh, and they were smart. And they were prescient. And they were caring. And they were compassionate. They had all those virtues. Um, and they brought them all here. They brought a tremendous work ethic. Uh, and, it, and I'm not so sure it was just, it wasn't just Italian Americans. I think it was that immigrants, whole, yes. all immigrants, and yeah. also African American. Let's not forget African Americans too. Especially after World War II. Oh, especially after World War II. You know, work, everyone worked hard because they wanted something better for the future. Right. They knew they weren't gonna, especially the women, they, they were not gonna achieve that American dream because they couldn't go to school. They couldn't have that career because they were taken out of school when they were 14 and were sent to these terrible sweatshops. But they knew that if they worked hard, they, they believed in America. They believed in the promise of America. And they were willing to, to, to do whatever it took to get something for the future. The cover of this book, I love. Did you pick it, or did the editor pick it? Uh, we, it was a, it was a marriage. Yeah, we both. It was we a marriage. It was a marriage. Yeah, okay. we both thought that that was the most telling uh, uh, of images that would want you to look deeper into this book. So the mailboxes the mailbox. and the names. Tell me, you took this picture. I did. Tell I me confess. about this picture. Well, the photograph is, is was it's it's an, an old set of mailboxes that were attached on a wall to a tenement house in the North End at the time, in the late 70s. And it speaks to a whole family of the same name people. It's all the Cotone family, Cotone. They were all from Abruzzi. Uh, they were aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, all living in four apartments in this sort of a beehive tenement house, exactly like what existed all over the United States where people lived in these home, you know, houses together where they lived in close quarters and sure. saw each other each, each day. 
And uh, I thought that that was pretty much spoke about what the neighborhood once was. It was an intact neighborhood where everyone knew each other, where there was this familiarity, where people still spoke the language. And I thought that this mailbox, um, as simple as it is, they actually put their, you know, some of them wrote their names and some people, you know, plastered their names on there. And it's all the same family. Um, How was it that you, you're a guy in your 40s um, and you, you find your roots, you were in Italy, you go into the North End. How were you able to infiltrate to get some of the pictures and stories that we're about to see? Well, How did you do that? Well, the thing was, uh, let's go back. So I, you know, I spent two or three years studying in Italy in my early, early 20s. So that when I came back home, and how I ended up in the North End was because I answered a job in the paper, in the Boston Globe. It had, th it had three sentences: um, work in a neighborhood setting, uh, work in, in, in one of the oldest anti-poverty neighborhood agencies in the country. Must speak Italian. So my passport, so to speak, is when I, when I got to Boston, I applied for the job. It was a miracle that I got the job because, first of all, if you know anything about the North End of Boston, if you're not from the same street. Forget People, about it. The, the same street, never mind the same neighborhood. <laughs> they know the movings of everybody. So here's this kid from Connecticut applying for this job, and I end up getting the, the position. And I think one of the reasons why, well, there are a couple of reasons. One was that I spoke the language. And my job ended up being to run the Senior, senior Citizen Center for the elderly in an anti poverty agency, smack dab in the middle of this cultural uh, mecca. Mecca, you, you know, yeah. uh, with a, these Italian American people who had lived there from the turn of the century. So were you um, doing a lot for these folks? Uh, you were translating for them? Yes. Uh, you were doing all kinds of things. So that's how you gained yes. their trust. Well, my job was to be an elderly advocate. I ran a senior citizen center so they could come and have coffee. We'd, we'd make soups on, on Wednesdays in the winter. We had, these act we had legal services for the people that were getting thrown out of their homes because uh, condo conversion was coming in. People were being literally thrown out into the streets in those days. So I became an elderly advocate, but I also became sort of a grandson. Um, and then the word got out in the street. You know, there was a grapevine. Everybody, you know, said... How big of an area are we talking oh, about? Oh, about a mile and a half. Mile and a half. Yeah, square. Uh, so the word gets out into the street. Go see Anthony. Uh, if you got any trouble, he'll help you because he speaks Italian and he'll help you. So, I would, so I'd, have this, I'd have this steady stream of people into my drop-in center all the time. And then they began to not just tell me about their problems, but they began to tell me about their lives, how they came over, what the conditions were like. And there's one story that I'll never forget. There was a 14-year-old woman. Uh, at the time, she was in her late 60s, but she told me a story that when she was 14, in 1925, being the oldest daughter, uh, the oldest person in a 12-sibling you know, 12 family, she had to go to work at 14. But in those days, there was a law that said you had to weigh 90 pounds, and she didn't. So she had to be weighed every month by the state to make sure that she weighed 90 pounds or she couldn't go to work. But she had to for the economic survival of the family. So their father was a boot black, and he put these Oxford shoes on her that were too big and put lead weights in it so that when she got on the scales, it would tip the scales. It still didn't work. So then her mother devised this diaper, and they put lead weights in it. Oh my and she gosh. describes what it was, the fear and the horror of going on that scale under the watchful eye of these state officials who had to make sure that that scale tipped 90 pounds or she wouldn't be able to work. And she talked about how scared she was as a 14-year-old child, not being able to go to school. She was a, an honor student, being taken out, had to work in a cho making chocolates in a candy factory at 14. Wow. So when she started, I started hearing stories like this, I thought, did you start getting out the, uh, the pen and... No, no, I, I got a tape recorder. Ah. So that when they came in to, to see me, I say, Senora, you know, would you mind if I... No, no, Anthony. Did you ahead. speak all the dialects? Because there well, were many. I can't say I spoke all of them, but let's... It's, it was kind of Good like, enough. It was kind of like scotch. I acquired a lot of tastes. After a while, Sicilian became very simple. You know, I, I understood Sicilian better. And this was a Sicilian now from like two or three hundred years ago. This is not Sicilian, uh, the, you know, this is dialect. Yeah, and then I would... I knew my own dialect because my family spoke a, a brand of Neapolitan, so I had an ear for dialects, so it wasn't so bad. I mean, I, I, I could hold my own okay, but uh, it was kind of a multi-ethnic, you know, neighborhood within a, an ethnic neighborhood. Sure, sure. Let's start looking at some of the pictures that sure. you took um, between 1972 and 1982, correct? Well, yeah. All this, right, so is this the neighborhood we're talking this about? This is the neighborhood now and the North End at the time, like I said, was a very intact neighborhood. 
geographically it was isolated from the rest of the city by the Southeast Expressway, which has now been sunk in the big dig. Uh, and so now it's just an open thoroughfare between uh, the North End and... And, um, and these communities are now gone. They're never going to come back well, the, again. The bricks and mortar are still there. Right. I mean, that the quaintness of the streets and the cobblestones and the Paul Revere house is still there. It, the people are gone. The people are gone. And, you know, it's isolated in the fact that, in the sense that, you know, you had water all around it. And so that was your neighborhood. And if you know anything about Boston, it's, it's very segregated. You know, at least sure. in the 70s and 80s. If you came from Southie, you were Irish. You know, and there were a few Italians sprinkled in there, but you were, you're pretty much, if you're from Charleston, you're Irish. If you're from the North End, you're, you're Italian. And that's, if you're from Roxbury, you were black. And it was, that's the way it was in There's those no days. There's no passion in your voice at all. I'm kidding. Um, tell me about this. My grandmother, she, um, my grandparents, this is where the Italian-American in me comes out. And that is, you know, had the, the, you, you know, the unique experience of being brought up around both sets of grandparents. One set that lived downstairs from me and another set who lived next door. And then aunts and uncles across the street. Three family homes, two family yeah, homes. Yeah, and right. cousins running all over the place. And my mother was the oldest in the family, so our house was the magnet. Everybody, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts. It was like a constant stream into my house. Tell me a little bit about My her. grandmother downstairs was the person who inspired me. I would just hang out with her all the time. Uh, and I couldn't, I, I mean, I loved her dearly. I, how could you not love your grandparents? But she was something special to me because she just had that sparkle in her eyes. She was full of energy. And I used to say to her, Grandma, why did you leave Italy? Why, you know, why would you? Because I'm now studying Michelangelo and Da Vinci in, in grammar school. And I'm thinking, and I see pictures of Italy. And I said, wow, how could you, why would you leave? I didn't realize my grandmother was a, you know, a poor farmer working up in the, you know, before there was, like, had no electricity, no running water. She would say to me, because I know like. But I couldn't understand, why was she talking this other language? What were all those statues up on the bureaus? You know, what are those, those who are all those saints all over, why do you have them all over your bureaus with these doilies all over the place? So I, I thought, someday I want to walk in her steps. And when I was 19, I did. I went back to her village. And that's what started me on this journey back in time. That's never going to end for you. All right, let's look at another photo. Yeah, this is the North End again. I, it, we're going to go back and forth, but the first chapter in the book is my experiences going back to my grandparents' village and finding her, uh, her relatives, my relatives. Uh, this is just a typical... It's the neighborhood, right? It's the neighborhood. Uh, mother and daughter and the kids just waiting while the guy cuts the meat. Uh, and this is in the North End. You know, just your, you know, a couple of light bulbs hanging over. Um, during my last... When, when I finished my graduate work, I, I went on this grand tour. Uh, it, I spent the whole summer uh, in this glorious summer of just photographing. Uh, and I just, got, I bought a, a train pass and I started in Rome and I went down and I went all around the boot. And these are the kind of photographs I just happened to capture in these little villages. This was actually taken in, uh, in uh, a town called uh, Bitonto. Uh, this is, women wore these outfits. Uh, as a, as a signature of their uh, elderliness. The, only, the elderly women wore these as their uniform. Mm. And she was reading her Bible. Did she mind you taking this picture or did, did she know? The woman next, I didn't want to take the photograph. And there was a woman standing next to her in the same garb, same outfit, and she saw me with the camera and she said to me, go ahead, take the picture. So I did. I didn't want to disturb because she was so totally meditative and totally immersed in that. She said, "Which is great." She didn't pose. No, I no, love no, that. no, no. She said, yeah. to, and the woman said to me, "She does this every day at three o'clock. She comes out and sits on her on the sidewalk and reads her." This What's is the, the North End. This is the North End, and uh, this woman. Um, I, I went to visit her one day, and uh, she she welcomed me, and, and she said to me, uh, you know, in Italian, you know, "Chi, cam chi cambia la via trova fortuna." She said to me. He who changes his life always finds good luck. In other words, she knew me as a stranger to the neighborhood, but she was welcoming me and, and encouraging me that on this path, you're going to find good luck. And you spoke in Italian. Oh, yeah, this was all in Italian. Yeah, yeah this was yeah. she was telling me about. Uh, you know. Yeah, this is the... Uh, I the love this guy. This I is the cool. cozy corner. Uh, this is Everybody in the neighborhood used to eat here. Um, this was like the locals would go there and just hang out. Like a diner? Uh, is it luncheonette? Luncheonette. Not even a diner, a luncheonette, which is even smaller, I suppose. Uh -huh. uh, this is 1980. That's Fred Musto. Um, and Such character. Yeah, in I mean, I, you know, and I didn't realize uh, what I had amassed until I went back after now 40, almost 40 years and looked at some of these faces. And uh, I, I really was, tr 
Yeah, I mean, this woman. What a face, right? Yeah, I was trying to get that, that visual biography, sure. we call it, um, on, on the person. I was trying to get the essence of these people in their portraits because I wanted to show, you know, the world um, this side of Italian American culture. What's her story? Her story was she. Uh, well, Before we get to this guy. Let's go back. Let's go back. Um, Sad story. She lived on the first floor. Um, they were going. To, they were converting her apartment. There were three apartments. The second and third floor were being converted into condominiums. And the workmen would come every morning at 7:30 and make a racket. And they had these big tubes where they were emptying, emptying out all the trash from all above. And she, all the noise would wake her up. And the dust would pour down all over her food and her clothes. And she refused to leave. They wanted to buy her out of her apartment. And she said no. I'm staying here. Uh, she was well, that's what she knew. That's what that she knew. Home. And uh, one day they, they got there really early, and she stepped out onto the sidewalk to look up to see what they were doing, and she fell and broke her hip, and never came back. Oh no. Yeah, Mar right. Mariana De Antonio, her name was. You remember all the names? Oh, of course, they're etched into my consciousness. I can't forget them. All right, let's go to that that uh, gentleman. Yeah, this is <laughs> members this is, only. This is Louis Louis Morada. He uh. Well, yeah, nice What's guy. His story? I know he, he looks a little <laughs> bit sinister because uh, he he was sort of like uh, part of the senior citizen club across the street from Mars. Was it, it just was, men? Just men only. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I think they you know they played cards a lot and stuff. But he was kind of the, he was kind of the lookout. Just wanted to make sure that <laughs> everybody was. Uh, okay. He knew you were taking his picture. Yeah, he knew, and I knew him very well. So I mean, and, and, and I know him uh, very well. Uh, it's just street life, you know. Uh, yeah, this is. Guy and his dog, um, Michele Leone, nice guy from Sicily. Um, These are great names. Yeah, and his dog. I, I don't remember the dog's name. No, I don't remember the dog. I'm, I'm shocked by that actually. Wait a minute. You remember everything. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. Yeah, A this wedding. is go this is going back to Italy now. This is you know, we're switching back to my experiences now. You know, trying to document that small village life that these immigrants lived. And this is a, a wedding in a little town called Sipiciano, which I'm sure not many people know even have any idea where it is. It's up in the mountains behind Cesarunca, which is another village that not many people know about. But this was a wedding, and you can look, if you look carefully, you can see the, the kids had just... Um, the reason why I took the picture was because I was standing there, and I noticed the kids were throwing rose petals in the alleyway all the way down to the bottom, and then I sort of waited there, and then, of course, the wedding procession came walking around. Because and then, it's a whole village affair, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so the, it was the job of the kids to put the rose petals on the alley, in the alleyway so that when, the, when the, uh, the bride came up with her father, that's her father, um, on their way to the church, uh, it would be strewn with these ro rose petals. And, uh, How neat. And I always wondered, you know, you know, everyone looks so serious in these pictures. And it looks like more like a funeral procession than anything else. And, and someone told me, they said, you know, uh, you're not supposed. You're not. The woman is not supposed to be happy because she's leaving her family. She's supposed to look very stern and, so and sober. Really? Yeah, it's part Just of the culture. Custom. Part yeah. of the culture. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more pictures that we can look at. I think. No. Maybe, maybe we're finished. Um, it's just that I want to go through this book um, and look at all these pictures. How many pictures did you put in? Two hundred and sixty-one. You know precisely, of course. Um, and there's just, you know, as you look, as you look through them. Faces, mailbox, um, you know, Christmas, uh, processions. If, if I could just say something about the photographs, Anna, you know, th this is from an insider looking out. Someone who was trusted, people who knew me. Yeah. Um, you know, I was a f familiar face. Uh, I was someone that they trusted. That I had, you know, I knew all these people. I knew their, I not, I knew them. I knew their kids. I knew their families. I knew their cousins. Um, um, you said to me, your, your dad said something to you. Yeah. And, and I love what you said. Yeah. Uh, I was telling you, if, if there's, yeah, if there's something that runs, if, the, if there's a certain thread that runs through all my books, the thread through these oral historians who told me their stories in all my books, they were very, uh, very uh, humble people. And very self-effacing and didn't expect And worked anything. hard when they got to this country. They worked very hard and, and wanted nothing in return from us. I'm talking about my generation. Uh, as, to the point where, you know, you'd go out and buy them a sweater and they'd tell you to bring it back. I don't want that. One thing they did want, and they, this, I heard the same story in Boston from the elderly people there, and I heard the same story all around Connecticut when I did the book on the women. Um, and it was not to be forgotten. 
don't forget me. Their message was, don't forget me. And my father really uh, captured that feeling one day. I was sitting in, in the kitchen with my mother and father. And I grew up in New Haven. This is over in the annex. And of course, my mother, you know, she's cooking happily away at, at the, you know, on the stove. And my father and I having, you know, a cup of espresso together, just talking. And he just looked at me. He said to me, you know, Anthony, I want to tell you something. I want you to remember this. He said, if I die and you forget me, then I'm dead. But if I die and you remember me, then I'm alive. So don't forget me. That's so beautiful. And you are now documenting all these people's lives and what they're doing. Did you set out to do this? Do no. you think? I mean, you're six books in writing about Italian Americans, about immigrants, about their lives. What do you think back, uh, six books in, what, what are you thinking? You mean for the, towards the future or looking, yeah, looking over time. my shoulder? Both, uh, perhaps. Well, I, I, what I'd like to do someday, and if, I, if, you know, if the stars line up right, is I'd like to do a documentary using the voices of all these people from... State. Because you have them recorded. Yeah, I have the actual voices of all these oral historians, these interviews that I've been recording now since the late 70s, both in Boston and New Haven. I want to do a documentary from the bottom up. I, you know, I've seen other documentaries and they're great, but I, I would like to focus on the people, you know, that built this country, uh, and I'd like them, their voices, to come out. Sort of like, like sort of like what Ken Burns did with the Civil War. He, it was very basic stuff. He just used interviews, letters, music from the time, still life photographs, which I have plenty of. Um, I have a dream that someday to do a documentary based on all this work. Well, let's get her done. Yeah, okay. so. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on. We've just touched the surface Thank of you. what you've been doing. Thanks for having me. But I appreciate you documenting the past. Thank you. So we don't. Spend all night kissing and the bottles right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find us a wish and find the keys to the door, but it's also a metaphor. Things keep going to the grocery store, but mine just the same time.